Today I'm going to be talking about how we can build systems that combine human and machine intelligence, uh, known as hybrid intelligence systems, that will go beyond what we're able to solve with just humans or just machines alone. And while I work on uh, intelligent systems, so I do a lot of AI and machine learning, uh, I'm also a human-computer interaction researcher. And so I want to start with this question. So what do we want from interaction? What is a perfect interaction? And my claim here is going to be that we want to be able to access and manipulate our environment. So I'm intentionally leaving actually human-to-human -human interaction uh, out of this for the sake of not being too controversial. Um, <laughs> But uh, what does this actually mean? Well, in a physical environment, it might mean that access is retrieving or using an object. Uh, manipulation is actually reconfiguring or, or changing that object in some way. Uh, in information environments, though, retrieval might look like information retrieval, actually searching for something, uh, viewing a document. And manipulation might mean editing or, or otherwise uh, computing over that document. And our goal is to do this in a way that is easy, is fluid, is natural. Maybe we use a little bit of a, a gesture and uh, minimal natural language to uh, cause some effect. And the, the problem there is that what I'm describing is magic. <laughs> we already have this notion of interaction, right? It is magic. A little bit of wording, a little bit of a, a wave of the magic wand, and something happens. And of course, that doesn't bode well for our ability to solve this problem. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on the idea that the magic we can have access to is, is the synthesis of humans and machines. Um, and specifically, I focus on using crowdsourcing to scale our access to human insight. Uh, so my message in this talk is going to be that crowdsourcing will allow us to uh, leverage collective human intelligence to augment AI systems and create robust interactive systems um, that we've never before had the possibility of creating. Uh, so let me start with a really brief uh, background on uh, crowdsourcing and human computation. So uh, most tasks that have been uh, crowdsourced in the past uh, have followed a pretty simple paradigm of microtasking. So you take a task, you break it down into small context-free units of work that can be completed independently, and then you go to a crowd platform or some large uh, call center-like uh, uh, source of human in, uh, labor, and you let anybody just take whatever tasks they want to off the stack. And this results in, in some answers, but the problem is it's often just as hard to confirm that something is correct as it is to generate the answer in the first place. So the uh, most common approach has been to just get multiple different answers. You can aggregate those answers via voting or, or something simple like averaging, and you get a more reliable final response. And this has been used to generate a lot of the data that, for example, goes into computer vision systems. Um, so this is a simple segmentation task. And there's still work to be done on these kind of offline tasks where we can get large-scale, uh, efficient uh, responses from people in order to, to train machine learning systems. Um, so just as one example, earlier this year we had some work that took the classic assumption that you want a lot of people to do a little task that all look pretty much like the same task and show that tool diversity in the annotation uh, task can actually allow people to collectively be more accurate. So you get different biases and different tools. All together we can aggregate that back down to a more, in this case, consistent boundary uh, over an object than would have been possible with any one person alone. Um, but what I think is exciting going forward is thinking about real-time crowdsourcing. So no longer posting a task and waiting days, hours or days to get a response back, but instead thinking about how we can immediately get responses to start powering systems that we actually deploy. Um, and when I say continuous, uh, when I say uh, real-time crowdsourcing, I actually mean continuous real-time crowdsourcing for the purposes of this talk, which means that we're going to have the same basic setup but we're going to want to actually maintain context, whether that's between frames in a video or interactions in a dialogue system. Uh, we want some continuity between these different tasks. But the reason we still think of these as task streams that are different from what you might normally uh, work on uh, is that we want to be robust to breaks. So at any time, any member of our crowd might have to go. And when somebody disappears, whether it be after uh, many components of a task stream or just a little, we want to be robust to saying, well, we got whatever insight you could provide, and then you left. And so this happens uh, in parallel across all different uh, contributors, and we don't know who's going to leave when. So we need some kind of streaming uh, aggregation. And we've come up with a lot of methods in my lab for doing exactly this. 
Uh, we have created conversational systems that allow you to interact in general open domains by, again, having multiple people behind the scenes, but we need now aggregation methods that maintain consistency and coherence as they find information and bring it back. Uh, we've thought about uh, transcription systems and how you can keep up with natural language speech from a, a speaker in front of a room like this. And we've actually deployed this in similar scenarios where anybody in the audience can just go to a link and start typing part of what they hear. And we're able to do as well as somebody with years of training to use special keyboards and to actually do this uh, task of captioning on the fly um, more, more robustly. And this gets around some of the uh, speech recognition issues mentioned earlier in settings like this. Uh, we've also thought about how to use uh, crowds to bridge accessibility gaps when actually interacting with systems. So we have a new tool this year that allows people to make a natural language request to their browser to have some task completed in a privacy-preserving way, uh, handing that task off to multiple people on the web to help them complete. And we've even thought about uh, creating all new digital environments using collective intelligence where we are able to make a request, describe something that we want to be true in an interface, and then make those changes on the fly. And the basic idea here is that we can find information, we can actually perceive our environments, we can help systems interact with existing tools, and even create new ones. And so this last one is so cool, I just have to play a video. Uh, this was created in a few minutes using one of our systems uh, by an undergrad with no prior uh, uh, prototyping or development experience. And you can see that this is a kind of mock-up of Flappy Bird, complete with uh, you know, end of game trigger and game over message. And again, this was all created in a few minutes by a non-expert. So the idea is you can now describe things, and they just come into existence. So we're getting closer to magic. But we can also go beyond what any individual is able to do on their own. Um, in some cases, that might mean expanding the ability of someone to complete an expert task, like programming, or um, uh, both on traditional tasks or on the web. Uh, so we have some work that shows how we can have people collaborate more efficiently and effectively, uh, almost getting a, a 200% return on what they're uh, collectively able to do compared to existing collaborative tools. Uh, and we also have prototyping by demonstration, uh, programming by demonstration prototyping tools that allow you to quickly mock up something just based on a description where other people are able to help you find the edge cases and demonstrate what the system should do based on uh, what you've described. Maybe even a little bit more fun to, to look at, um, we have some tools that allow you to actually go beyond what we've ever been able to do with collectives of people before, uh, even down to a motor level. So classic work in HCI has shown that there are fundamental performance bounds on uh, people's ability to perceive and then act in the world. Uh, the simplest among these is if you see some visual cue, you want to press a button as fast as you can. Uh, this is going to take about 300 milliseconds. It's quite robustly lower, bound, lower bounded at 200 milliseconds. So Nobody can move faster than about 200 milliseconds. And that seems reasonable, except there are some things that we uh, can't do with human input because of this bound. For example, if you're driving a car and you want to uh, quickly avoid some obstacle, it might actually be that the automated system could have made the decision faster than any person could have. Um, but in some recent work, we looked at how to use the agent, the automated systems, um, representation of the world to actually speculate what might happen over a very, very small, more predictable time bound, like a half a second. And then we can project out what those worlds might look like, get feedback from people in advance of actually needing it, and populate the agent's policy um, before it's ever needed, so that when we actually see which version of the world came to be, we have their answer already queued up. And it was my, probably my favorite graph uh, that I can show this works. <laughs> Reminder, lower is better. <laughs> uh, so this is comparing uh, individual performance on the same task to being able to use look ahead. And again, this is because we're actually telling the system what it needs to know about the world fractions of a second before it needs to know it. So this is as fast as the system can go on the left. Or your right, I guess. All right. We can also go beyond um, just information environments. So pretty much everything here has relied on some signal that I'm getting from the computer. We can actually start to bridge this to the real world. Um, so we're looking at augmented reality systems where you can, again, just describe anything you want to be true about your surroundings, and they become true uh, immediately. 
Uh, so here you see some students describing where they want blocks to be placed in the air and if they want them to move or, or you know, orbit around them. Uh, and all of this could, becomes true in seconds. We've also looked a lot at robotics and being able to uh, bridge the understanding gap between what the robot knows about the world and what is actually in a novel physical environment. Uh, so here the robot can follow commands uh, to, a, to attain some, or to eventually get to some uh, described target. Uh, and in another project, we were looking at how you can actually change the robot's perception so that even if it can get there on its own, uh, we can tell it about new objects that it may not be aware of. So here we take a natural language reference and a 3D scan of a, a, an environment. We provide a uh, mixed initiative selection tool to multiple people in parallel who are able to, in real time, go out, find the reference object in the scene, the referenced object in the scene, and then uh, annotate it so that the robot can, without failing the first time, get new training data and, and successfully complete the task. Okay. So just to quickly recap in the last minute or so here, um, the idea of leveraging human intelligence uh, in computational processes can allow us to create more robust systems and actually systems that we can deploy in the wild and start to do exactly what was alluded to in, the, in Scott's keynote, um, collect data that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. We can also do this in real time. So we can create interactive systems that go out and operate in environments that AI would not today be able to uh, succeed in and generate that training data even when there's a, a, a tight time requirement. And finally, we can actually look at how workflows can help people offload some of the prior assumptions that we had about expertise and accomplish expert tasks with groups of people who have the, the right computational coordination between them. Okay, and going forward, the most important message I have is that AI doesn't operate in a bubble, uh, naming of prior systems aside. <laughs> um, these systems, whether indirectly or directly, impact uh, real users, real people. And so as an example, uh, upcoming AAAI work that we have with collaborators is looking at how a, a human and an AI agent working in unison can be negatively affected by what we otherwise would think of as a positive change. So that AI agent gets 5% more accurate, and team performance can actually be hurt by up to 46%, which is amazing. Um, here we propose new ways to offset that, so you actually get benefit from um, these, uh, these improvements in the system, but this has to be done in a strategic way, and understanding better how uh, people and machines can be put into effective teams is one of the things we're, we're most excited about going forward. And the goal is to create more effective ways to combine uh, intelligence of, of all types to produce systems that are so powerful and intuitive that they're almost like magic. Thanks. <laughs>